Seven Facts You May Not Know About Baptism Baptism, an ancient ritual with deep spiritual significance, holds a central place in the practice of Christianity. Beyond its outward symbolism of cleansing and rebirth, baptism carries profound theological truths and historical roots that often go overlooked. As we delve into the seven lesser-known aspects of baptism, we uncover its significance in religious practice and its diverse meanings across different Christian traditions. Join us on a journey through baptism, where each fact reveals new insights into this timeless sacrament. If you're eager to explore more about baptism and deepen your understanding, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and share this insightful journey with others seeking spiritual enlightenment. Baptism originated in Jewish law. The baptism ceremony is considered to have originated from John the Baptist or John the Baptist, according to the New Testament, who is considered a forerunner to Christianity used baptism as the central sacrament of his messianic movement. He performed the baptism rite for Jesus at the Jordan River. Christians consider Jesus to have instituted the sacrament of baptism. This is what I first researched about baptism. I believe that not only me but also many Christians believe that the ritual of baptism began in the New Testament period, however, the practice of baptism did not originate with Christianity, it has its roots in Jewish ceremonial law. The Jewish tradition included various forms of ritual washing, or mikvi, which were used for purification purposes. These rituals are mentioned throughout the Old Testament, particularly in Leviticus. For instance, Leviticus 15.13 states, When a man is cleansed from his discharge, he is to count off seven days for his ceremonial cleansing he must wash his clothes and bathe himself with fresh water, and he will be clean. Although the term baptism is not used to describe the Jewish rituals, the purification rites in Halakha, Jewish law and tradition, called Tivila, have some similarities to baptism, and the two have been linked. The Tivila is the act of immersion in naturally sourced water, called a mikveh. These ceremonial washings were a form of physical and spiritual purification, preparing individuals for participation in religious activities. The concept of immersion in water for purification and dedication to God laid the foundation for the Christian practice of baptism. Sooner or later, no matter how carefully we keep something clean, everything becomes unclean. God has given certain standards to express this principle. Those standards, the Levitical law, provide ways to identify uncleanness, uncleanness, and procedures for washing. Washing, or baptism, is for everything from mold on the wall, Leviticus 14, 33, 53, to washing after childbirth, Leviticus 12, 1, 8, to receiving a healed leper back into the community, Leviticus 13, 1, 36, Leviticus 14, 1, 32. So when the people saw John baptizing in the Jordan River, they thought he was simply following the traditions of washing. In addition, the mikveh was often used for the ritual purification of priests before they performed their duties, as well as for individuals who had become ritually unclean for various reasons. This practice symbolized a cleansing from impurity and a readiness to enter into a holy state before God. The New Testament builds on this concept with baptism representing a spiritual cleansing and a dedication to a new life in Christ. Jesus was baptized. We can look up the New Testament, and we will find the word baptism first appears in Matthew 3.13, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. The person who baptized Jesus was John the Baptist. The purpose of John the Baptist's baptism was completely different from the purpose of Jesus' baptism. John's baptism was the baptism of repentance, Matthew 3.11. But Jesus was sinless and had no need of repentance. Even John was taken aback at Jesus coming to him. John recognized his sin and was aware that he, a sinful man in need of repentance, was unfit to baptize the spotless Lamb of God, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Matthew 3.14 Not only John, but even we Christians find it difficult to understand the purpose of Jesus' baptism then why was Jesus baptized? It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus responded to John's question in Matthew 3.15. There are several reasons why it was fitting for John to baptize Jesus at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. Jesus was about to embark on his great work, and it was appropriate that he be publicly recognized by his forerunner. John was the voice crying in the wilderness prophesied by Isaiah calling people to repentance in preparation for their Messiah, Isaiah 43. By baptizing him, John was declaring to all that here was the one they had been waiting for, the Son of God, the one he had predicted would baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire Matthew 3.11.
The baptism of Jesus by John takes on an additional dimension when we consider that John belonged to the tribe of Levi and was a direct descendant of Aaron. Luke specifies that both John's parents were of the priestly line of Aaron, Luke 1, 5. One of the duties of the priests in the Old Testament was to offer sacrifices before God. John the Baptist's baptism of Jesus can be seen as the priest's presentation of the final sacrifice. John's words on the day after the baptism had a distinctly priestly air behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. Jesus' baptism also showed that he sympathized with sinners. His baptism symbolized the sinner's baptism into the righteousness of Christ, dying with him and being raised free from sin and able to walk in new life. His perfect righteousness will satisfy all the requirements of the law for sinners who could never hope to do so on their own. When John hesitated to baptize the sinless Son of God, Jesus replied that it was right to fulfill all righteousness, Matthew 3.15. By this he refers to the righteousness he gives to all who come to him to exchange their sins for his righteousness, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Additionally, Jesus coming to John showed his approval of John's baptism, testifying that it came from heaven and was approved by God. This would be important in the future as others began to doubt John's authority, especially after his capture by Herod, Matthew 14.3.11. Perhaps most importantly, the public baptism recorded for all future generations the perfect embodiment of the Holy Trinity revealed in heavenly glory. The direct testimony from heaven of the Father's satisfaction with the Son and the coming of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus Matthew 3 16, 17 is a beautiful picture of God's Trinitarian nature. It also describes the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the salvation of those whom Jesus came to save. The Father has loved His elect since before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.4, He sent His Son to seek and save the lost, Luke 19.10, and the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, John 16.8, and draws the believer to the Father through the Son. All the glorious truth of God's mercy through Jesus Christ was revealed in His baptism. Baptism doesn't save anyone. One common misconception about baptism is that the act itself confers salvation. However, the New Testament teaches that salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone, not through any external ritual, including baptism. This is a crucial theological distinction that underscores the nature of Christian salvation. Ephesians 2.8.9 clearly articulate the basis of Christian salvation for it is by grace you have been saved, through faith and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. This passage emphasizes that salvation is a gift from God, granted through His grace and received through faith. It is not something that can be earned by human efforts or religious rituals. Similarly, Romans 3, 24 states, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus here. Paul highlights that all believers, regardless of their background, are justified and made righteous before God through faith in Jesus Christ. Baptism is an important act of obedience and a public declaration of faith, but it is not how one is saved. Instead, it is an outward expression of an inward change that has already occurred in a believer's heart. This inward change is the result of placing one's faith in Jesus Christ and accepting Him as Lord and Savior. Romans 6, 3, 4 illustrates this concept or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. We too may live a new life. Baptism symbolizes the believer's identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It signifies that the believer has died in their old life of sin and has been raised to a new life in Christ. The primary role of faith in salvation is emphasized throughout the New Testament. John 3.16, one of the most well-known verses in the Bible, states, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. This verse underscores that belief in Jesus Christ is the key to eternal life. Acts 16.31 also highlights the importance of faith, they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved you and your household here. The emphasis is on believing in Jesus as the means of salvation, not on performing any specific ritual. A poignant illustration of salvation by faith alone is the account of the thief on the cross. According to Luke 23, 39, 43, as Jesus was crucified, 
two criminals were also crucified alongside him. One of these criminals mocked Jesus, but the other recognized Jesus' innocence and his divine authority. He said, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, Jesus responded, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This thief had no opportunity to be baptized. His salvation came solely through his faith in Jesus. This account powerfully demonstrates that salvation is not contingent upon baptism or any other ritual, but is granted through faith in Christ. The thief's plea for Jesus to remember him was an acknowledgement of Jesus' lordship and an expression of his belief in him. Jesus' assurance that the thief would be with him in paradise confirms that faith alone is sufficient for salvation. To clarify, baptism itself does not save anyone rather. It is the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ that saves. Baptism is a vital act of obedience and a public declaration of faith, but it is not the mechanism by which salvation is received. This distinction is crucial to understanding the nature of Christian salvation and the role of baptism within it. Given that baptism does not save, one might ask whether it is necessary to undergo baptism at all. The answer is yes, baptism is still necessary and holds significant importance in the life of a believer, though not as a means of salvation. The Old Testament provides foundational principles for understanding the significance of baptism. In the Old Testament, ceremonial washings were common and often commanded by God for purification purposes. For example, in Leviticus 16.4, the high priest was required to bathe his body in water before putting on the holy garments for the Day of Atonement. These washings symbolized purification and consecration to God. Similarly, in the New Testament, baptism is a symbolic act of purification and dedication. While it does not have the power to save, it represents the believer's commitment to follow Jesus and live a life consecrated to God. Jesus himself was baptized, setting an example for his followers to emulate Matthew 3.13.17. Jesus' command to his disciples also underscores the importance of baptism. In the Great Commission, Jesus instructed his followers to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19. This command demonstrates that baptism is an integral part of the discipleship process and a vital step in the journey of faith. Understanding the proper role of baptism helps to avoid misconceptions and emphasizes the true nature of Christian salvation rooted in faith in Jesus Christ expressed through obedience and public declaration in baptism. If baptism isn't necessary for salvation, do we need to be baptized? My answer is yes, we should be baptized to be a Christian. The main reason for a believer to be baptized is obedience to Christ. In the Great Commission, Jesus told his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the world, Matthew 28, 18, 20. If Jesus commanded the apostles to make disciples and baptize them, then it would make sense that a disciple would be willing to be baptized. It is absurd for someone who claims to be a disciple to object to the first thing Jesus mentioned along with being a disciple. That is like a disciple refusing to be taught all the things that Jesus commanded so that he could obey. Water baptism, as a ritual, does not save anyone. Nor is the obedience required for baptism. Baptism is the outward image of an inward transformation. Baptism describes the washing away of sins, and also the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ on behalf of the believer. Baptism indicates the believer's identification with Christ. In first century Judaism, baptism was performed only on Gentiles who were converting to Judaism. When John began baptizing Jews, they admitted that, because of their sins, they were no better than the Gentiles. They, like the Gentiles, needed to repent. This is why John replied to the unbaptized religious leaders, and do not think that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. I tell you that God is able from these stones to raise children to Abraham the religious leaders at least partly relied on their Jewish heritage to save them. But John told them that their heritage did not matter. John's baptism was a public declaration of one's sin and need for repentance in preparation for the return of Christ. In the early church, baptism soon became the way for a person to be identified as a true believer. If a person has a casual connection with Christians or a church but is not baptized, no one considers that person a Christian. When the person is baptized, he or she is considered part of the church. If the person was Jewish, he or she was often cut off from his or her family and synagogue 
and in the Roman Empire, this was also when the real persecution could begin. Baptism does not make a person a Christian, but it publicly identifies a person as a Christian and subjects him or her to persecution in many cultures even today. Therefore, to obey Christ, a believer must be baptized. A believer's baptism pictures the washing away of sins, the believer's death and resurrection with Christ, and the believer's public identification as a Christian. Baptism has many different purposes. Baptism is a multifaceted rite within Christianity, serving a variety of spiritual, symbolic, and communal purposes. While it is primarily known as a public declaration of faith and an act of obedience, baptism also holds deeper meanings and serves multiple functions within Christians. A public declaration of faith. One of the most recognized purposes of baptism is its role as a public declaration of faith. When a person is baptized, they are openly professing their belief in Jesus Christ and their commitment to following him. This public aspect is significant because it aligns with Jesus' command to his disciples in Matthew 28, 19, 20, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Baptism thus serves as an outward demonstration of an inward faith, making a clear statement to the community about one's allegiance to Christ. A symbol of new life. Baptism symbolizes the believer's death to sin and resurrection to a new life in Christ. Romans 6 3 4 explains, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. This symbolic act represents the believer's transformation and the beginning of a new chapter in their spiritual journey. Act of Obedience Baptism is also an act of obedience to Christ's command. As mentioned earlier, Jesus instructed his followers to baptize new disciples. By being baptized, believers are following Jesus' example and his directives. This act of obedience is a crucial step in the discipleship process, reflecting a willingness to submit to Christ's authority and to live according to his teachings. A Sign of Repentance in the New Testament, baptism is closely associated with repentance. John the Baptist's ministry centered on a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, Mark 1, 4. When individuals came to John to be baptized, they were confessing their sins and demonstrating their desire to turn away from sin and toward God. Acts 2.38 also highlights this connection. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here, baptism is linked with repentance and the reception of the Holy Spirit, marking a decisive break from the past and a commitment to a new way of life. E a means of identifying with the Christian community. Baptism serves as a rite of initiation into the Christian community. Through baptism, believers are formally recognized as members of the body of Christ. This communal aspect of baptism fosters a sense of belonging and unity among Christians. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 emphasizes this collective identity for we were all baptized by one spirit to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Baptism thus transcends individual identity, integrating the believer into the larger community of faith. A representation of spiritual cleansing. Baptism also symbolizes spiritual cleansing and purification. The act of being immersed in water represents the washing away of sins and the purification of the soul. 1 Peter 3.21 states, And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also not the removal of dirt from the body but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. While the water itself does not have magical properties, it signifies the believer's inner cleansing and the forgiveness of sins through Christ's sacrifice. He a public witness and testimony. Baptism provides an opportunity for believers to publicly testify to the transformative work of God in their lives. It serves as a witness to friends, family, and the broader community of the believer's commitment to Christ. This public testimony can have a profound impact, encouraging others to consider their faith and relationship with God. In Acts 8.36-38, the Ethiopian eunuch's baptism serves as a powerful example of an immediate response to the gospel and a public declaration of faith our affirmation of God's promises. Baptism is an affirmation of God's promises to believers. 
it is a tangible reminder of God's covenant and His faithfulness. In Colossians 2.12, Paul writes, Having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through your faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead baptism reminds believers of the hope and assurance of resurrection and eternal life through Jesus Christ. There are different methods of baptism. The Bible mentions many different types of baptism, specifically eight types of baptism. Baptism of John Matthew 3, 7, Baptism unto Repentance. John the Baptist was the forerunner of the coming of the Messiah. He was sent to call the nation of Israel to repentance and recognition of the coming Messiah. Baptism of Jesus Matthew 3, 13, 17, Baptism of Identification, those who were baptized by the Lord expressed that they identified with the rejected king. They have experienced the truth of John's baptism and have now identified with their Lord and Master. Baptism of the Holy Spirit Acts 1 5 Acts 2 1 4 Baptism of the Spirit in the formation of the Church of God The baptism in this portion was a one-time action. It was a special occasion that will never be repeated. It reached its conclusion on four separate occasions. I Acts 2 1 4 was evidenced in his baptism of Jewish believers. The nature of the baptism is that Jewish believers are now in the Church. I Acts 8, 15, 17, Baptism in Samaria, the Samaria, the Samaria, the Samaritans formed a separate entity of the nation of Israel. The Jews despised and looked down on them. Samaritans were considered to be a lower class. Because of that, God in His grace baptized the Samaritan believers in the same way as the Jewish believers. E. I Acts 10, 44, God called Peter to preach the gospel to Cornelius, a Roman general. By doing so, God showed Peter that there was now no more any difference between Jews and Gentiles. We are all one in Christ. By Cornelius receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, believers in Jerusalem acknowledged that God was now working equally among the Gentiles. IV Acts 19.1.6 Baptism of the followers of John the Baptist These are the last of the first group who acknowledged God. They repented while looking for the Messiah. They have now been informed that the Messiah has come. Furthermore, they were told of their need for salvation, and that the one whom they had looked had sent his spirit to indwell his people. These last individuals who had looked for the one to come received the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the wrath of God, Matthew 20, 22, 23, Calvary, in all its aspects, Almighty God poured his wrath against sin on the sin bearer. He was covered in sorrow as God punished him for the sins of all who believe in Jesus. Believer's Baptism, Romans 6, 4, identification with the risen Lord and glory, he who was despised and rejected is now crowned. He is seated on the right hand of the majesty of the heavens. When we are baptized, we in the picture go down into death and are buried, finally rising to the newness of life. We are now seen in our risen Christ. Baptism of the Old Testament saints, 1 Corinthians 10, 2, salvation from Egypt. This baptism occurred when the nation of Israel passed through the Red Sea. Before this, the nation had been slaves to the Egyptians. God delivered them from slavery through the death of the Passover lamb. The lamb was slain and its blood was placed on the side posts and upper lintel of the door. All who passed under the bloodshed were redeemed. Leaving Egypt, they passed through the Red Sea. By their baptism they have identified themselves as the people of God. They now acknowledge that there is one God and He is their God. Baptism of fire, Matthew 3.11, Judgment of God, the fire of God cleanses the filth from the world. His fire will purge the dross and leave the pure. In His people, all works not done for God will be destroyed. In the end, there will be the gold, silver, and precious stones. The gold shows us God and what came from Him. Silver speaks of our redemption. The silver of the tabernacle has redeemed us. Precious stones show the moral beauties of the Godhead. Baptism into the unity of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4, 3, 6, unity of the Spirit evidenced in the eternal unity of God as it is found in the people of God. We are taught that like there is unity in heaven, so there should be unity on earth among the Lord's people. There are no restrictions on who can baptist us, or where the activity can be performed. Certainly. Here's an expanded passage with real-life examples to illustrate the points about baptism. In the heart of Christian practice lies the timeless ritual of baptism, a profound act of faith that defies conventional constraints. Unlike many religious ceremonies bound by rigid rules, baptism stands as a beacon of inclusivity and spiritual liberation. It transcends the need for ordained clergy or elaborate settings, embracing instead the simplicity of a believer's heartfelt commitment. Take, for example, the story of Sarah, a young woman with a deep faith who, 
despite being physically disabled and wheelchair-bound, was baptized in the warm waters of a local lake. Surrounded by her church family and supported by loving friends, Sarah's baptism was a testament to the community's belief that faith knows no physical limitations. Her joyous declaration of faith in Christ echoed across the water, a powerful reminder that baptism is a spiritual journey open to all who seek it. Baptism, as taught by Jesus in Matthew 28, 19, calls believers to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. This commandment echoes through the ages, emphasizing the spiritual authority behind the act rather than the specific individual performing it. It speaks to the universal accessibility of baptism any believer, moved by faith and understanding, can carry out this sacred act. The setting for baptism is equally poignant. It does not require the grandeur of a cathedral or the sanctity of a baptismal font. Instead, it beckons believers to the waters a river's gentle flow, the serene depths of an ocean, or the stillness of a baptismal pool. Each baptismal site becomes a sacred ground, where the waters symbolize not just cleansing but a profound spiritual rebirth a testament to the believer's journey of faith and renewal in Christ. Age is no barrier to the embrace of baptism's grace. Consider the elderly couple, John and Mary, who after a lifetime of faithful service to their church, chose to renew their commitment to Christ through baptism. With their children and grandchildren standing witness, they affirmed their unwavering faith and devotion to Christ, finding new strength and purpose in their spiritual journey. Even physical limitations cannot hinder the call to baptism. Churches and communities rally around those with disabilities, ensuring that everyone, regardless of circumstance, can partake in this sacred rite. It is a testament to the boundless love of God who sees beyond physical impediments to the heart's unwavering devotion. For those contemplating baptism, let the words of Peter in Acts 2.38 resonate deeply repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This invitation is not just a call to cleanse but a promise of spiritual renewal and divine presence in your life. Embrace the waters of baptism as a profound step in your journey of faith, a public declaration of your commitment to follow Christ, and a testament to God's enduring love and grace. The beauty of baptism lies not in its ceremony but in its profound symbolism a journey of faith, forgiveness, and spiritual awakening. It is a testament to the universal call of Christ, drawing believers from all walks of life into the embrace of divine grace. May the waters of baptism continue to flow as a beacon of hope and renewal, inspiring hearts and souls to embrace the transformative power of faith. Baptism must be done with both knowledge and free will. Baptism must be done with both knowledge and free will. You cannot be forced to accept God's salvation, and you can't be baptized through force, fear, or coercion. For obedience to be accepted, it must be an action of the free will of the individual. It shows love for the object of their obedience. The participants must be knowledgeable of the function being performed. If they are not aware of the value of the action, they will have no understanding of the action being performed. In the Christian faith, baptism is not just a ritualistic act but a profound spiritual commitment that must be undertaken with both knowledge and free will. This principle emphasizes the importance of personal understanding and voluntary participation in the baptismal process. Firstly, knowledge is essential for baptism because it ensures that the individual fully comprehends the significance of the act. Baptism is more than a mere tradition, it is a public declaration of faith, a symbolic act of cleansing and renewal and a step of obedience to Christ's command. The Bible underscores the importance of understanding in several passages. Acts 2.38 Peter replied, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This verse highlights that repentance, which requires an understanding of one's sins and a desire to turn away from them, precedes baptism. Romans 6.3.4 or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. This passage explains the symbolic meaning of baptism, linking it to Christ's death and resurrection. Understanding this connection is crucial for anyone seeking baptism. Without knowledge, the act of baptism can become a hollow ritual devoid of its true spiritual significance. 
Therefore, instruction and education are often provided before baptism to ensure that candidates understand what it means to follow Christ, the significance of repentance, and the implications of living a new life in Him. In addition to knowledge, free will is a critical component of baptism. The decision to be baptized must be made freely, without coercion, to reflect a genuine commitment to Christ. This principle is rooted in the biblical understanding of free will and personal responsibility in matters of faith. Matthew 16, 24, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus calls individuals to follow him out of their own free will, highlighting the personal choice involved in becoming his disciple. Revelation 3.20 Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person. And they with me this verse illustrates that Jesus invites individuals to open their hearts to him voluntarily. He does not force his way in. Baptism, as an expression of this voluntary commitment, should reflect an individual's heartfelt decision to follow Christ. When a person is baptized out of free will, it signifies their acceptance of Jesus as their Lord and Savior and their willingness to live according to his teachings. Baptism performed without proper understanding or voluntary consent can undermine its spiritual significance. For instance, infant baptism is a practice in some Christian traditions where the child is baptized based on the faith of their parents. While well-intentioned, this practice raises questions about the individual's understanding and choice. Acts 8 37 as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized, Philip said. If you believe with all your heart, you may the eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This account shows the importance of personal belief as a prerequisite for baptism. Similarly, baptisms performed under social or familial pressure may lack the genuine commitment that baptism is meant to represent. Without the individual's free will, the act becomes a formality rather than an authentic declaration of faith. Churches play a crucial role in ensuring that baptism candidates have both knowledge and free will. This often involves instruction and catechesis. Many churches provide pre-baptismal classes or catechesis to educate candidates about the meaning and implications of baptism. This instruction helps ensure that individuals understand the commitment they are making. Personal testimony and confession candidates are often asked to share their testimony and confess their faith in Jesus Christ before being baptized. This practice ensures that the decision is personal and voluntary. Counseling and guidance pastoral counseling can help individuals reflect on their decisions and ensure that it is made freely and with full understanding. If you are considering baptism, it is essential to approach this significant step with careful thought, prayer, and preparation. Here are some key pieces of advice to guide you. 1. Seek understanding. Take the time to learn about the meaning and significance of baptism. Study the relevant biblical passages and seek guidance from trusted spiritual leaders or mentors. Understanding the spiritual implications of baptism will deepen your commitment and enhance your experience. 2. Pray for guidance. Prayer is a vital part of the decision-making process. Ask God for wisdom, clarity, and guidance as you consider baptism. Pray for a heart that is open to His leading and for the strength to follow His will. 3. Reflect on your faith. Reflect on your personal faith journey and your relationship with Jesus Christ. Consider your reasons for wanting to be baptized and ensure that your decision is based on a genuine desire to follow Him. 4. Discuss with a pastor or mentor. Have conversations with a pastor, spiritual mentor, or a mature Christian who can provide counsel and support. They can help you navigate any questions or concerns and offer valuable insights based on their own experiences. 5. Prepare spiritually and emotionally. Baptism is a significant spiritual milestone, and it is essential to prepare both spiritually and emotionally. Engage in regular prayer, Bible study, and self-reflection to strengthen your faith and readiness for this step. 6. Consider public testimony. Many churches include a public testimony as part of the baptismal process. Be prepared to share your faith journey and your reasons for wanting to be baptized with the congregation. This public declaration can be a powerful affirmation of your commitment. 7. Understand the symbolism. Recognize that baptism is a symbolic act that represents your identification with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. It signifies your decision to leave behind your old life and embrace a new life in Christ. 8. Embrace the community. Baptism often takes place within the context of a church community. Embrace the support and fellowship of your church family, 
who will walk alongside you in your faith journey. 9. Live out your faith baptism is not the end but the beginning of a lifelong journey of faith. Commit to living out your faith daily, growing in your relationship with Christ and serving others in love. Approaching baptism with knowledge, free will, and a heart fully committed to Christ will ensure that this significant step is a meaningful and transformative experience in your spiritual journey. In conclusion, exploring these seven lesser-known facts about baptism reveals its multifaceted nature and profound significance in the Christian faith, from its origins in Jewish purification rites to its symbolic representation of new life in Christ, baptism bridges the gap between the spiritual and the physical realms. It underscores the importance of personal faith and commitment to God, rather than mere ritualistic practice. Whether you are considering baptism for yourself or seeking to deepen your understanding of this sacred sacrament, remember that it is a step of faith, an outward expression of an inward transformation. Embrace the spiritual journey ahead with a heart open to the grace and love of God. May your exploration of baptism enrich your faith and lead you to a deeper relationship with the divine.